Welcome to section 11.2. Today we're going to focus a little bit more on these identities and we're going to introduce some new ones, specifically negative identities and Pythagorean identities. So the Pythagorean identities kind of are offshoots from the Pythagorean theorem. That's why we call them Pythagorean identities, but we'll get there in a second. So let's just first start things off by talking about some of these negative or negative identities. Sometimes um, we might take the sine or cosine or tangent value of a negative number because it is possible to have a negative angle. Remember we can always measure an angle uh, going downwards. So sometimes we might have a negative angle. We do have specific identities for these negative angles. So specifically when we're taking the sine of a negative angle that's actually the same as taking the opposite or in other words a negative sine value of the positive angle. So this is an identity, this is a rule, this is always going to be true. And what's nice about this is that if this is the identity for sine, it's also the identity for the reciprocal trig function of sine, which would be cosecant. So just in case we're taking the uh, cosecant value of a negative uh, angle, it's also going to work the same way as sine would. So what's nice about this is if you kind of know one, you know what the other one is as well. Same thing with cosine. Let's say we're taking the cosine of a negative angle. The identity is actually going to be a positive cosine. Uh, in, the, in this case, taking the cosine of the positive version of the angle. And if this is the identity for cosine, that means it's going to be the identity for the reciprocal trig function of cosine, which would be secant. So secant would work the same way. So we have another identity as well. If you know one, you kind of know the other one as well. Going on to tangent, let's say we're taking the tangent of a negative angle, it actually works out the same way a sine does. So if this is the identity for tangent, that means it's also the identity for the reciprocal trig function, which would be cotangent. Oh, there should be a negative out front there. So a few more identities, whenever you see the sine of a negative angle, um, we can rewrite it as negative sine of x. If we see the cosine of a negative angle, we can just rewrite it as cosine of x. And if we see the tangent of a negative angle, we can simply rewrite it as a negative tangent. So these are identities. These are uh, different uses the, of uh, identities we can use when we're helping to prove different expressions or trying to reduce some trig expressions as well. So good things to know. All right, so let's put some of these negative identities to use. Let's say we want to reduce uh, this fraction to a single trig expression. We just want one trig value left. So uh, whenever we see a sign of a negative x or a negative angle, that is the same thing as saying negative sine of x. It's an identity. They mean the same thing, so we can essentially replace it. Now for cosine, actually, uh, it's just a regular cosine of x. So if we simplify that, notice how we have sine over cosine. So if we simplify that, uh, it would be tangent, sine over cosine, one of those quotient identities. But since sine was negative, that means our tangent will be negative. So there is our single trig expression. If we check out another one, tangent of a negative angle, in this case negative alpha, is going to give us um, the identity of negative tangent of a positive alpha. And notice here how we have cosecant, which is the reciprocal of sine. So this uh, trig expression here would work the same way as sine of negative alpha. And that would actually give us, uh, we would have times a negative cosecant of a positive alpha, coming kind of running out of room there. So if we check it out, we have a negative times a negative, which is essentially a positive. So we can rewrite this as tangent alpha cosecant alpha. But again, we want a single trig expression, so let's take this a little bit further. In the last unit or lesson, we talked about how we can rewrite these trig functions in terms of sine and cosine, which might help us reduce them. So tangent is the same as sine alpha over cosine alpha. And we're going to multiply that by cosecant, which is the reciprocal of sine. So notice how the sines are going to cancel each other out. We're left with 1 over cosine of theta, but that would simplify to secant. We have that reciprocal of cosine, so we're left with secant of alpha.
All right, so we're done with the negative identities. Kind of simple, if you ask me. Let's go ahead and talk about the Pythagorean identity. And we're actually going to have identities. There really should be a plural here. Because we're going to, this is the main one, if you will. This is the Pythagorean identity. But we're actually going to get two more identities based off of this one. But let's just focus on the main one for now. Um, we have the main Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Now this comes actually from the Pythagorean theorem, which we know is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So what's happening is why we actually have this is based off of the unit circle. If we draw one for a second, let's say we have this angle right here and we form this right triangle. So we know on the unit circle that the x value is representative of cosine, so that maybe we'll say this is cosine of x, and the y value or the height of our triangle is based off of sine. So we can say this is sine of x. Now since this is a unit circle, unit mean, meaning our radius is 1, our hypotenuse in the unit circle is 1. So if we do the Pythagorean theorem on this triangle in the unit circle, we would have a sine squared, which is this piece, plus cosine squared, which is this piece, would equal 1 squared, but we know 1 squared is just 1. So this Pythagorean identity is strictly based off of the unit circle, something we've been doing for a while now uh, in class. So pretty simple way to remember the, Pyth the Pythagorean identity is using the, Pythag or sorry, the Pythagorean theorem on our unit circle. Now what we can do is rearrange this a little bit to get a few more identities. Um, let's just say we want to get sine squared all by itself. That means we can subtract the cosine squared x over. So we can rewrite these if you will. If we subtract the cosine squared over, we would have 1 minus cosine squared x. So there's another identity. It, it looks a little bit different than the original, but again, it's still another identity. It's just taking the original one and rewriting it. Instead of getting sine squared all by itself, let's get cosine squared all by itself. That means we'd have to subtract the sine squared x over. So cosine squared x would equal 1 minus sine squared x. So there's another identity. Again, it's kind of based off the of or I'm sorry, based off of the original, but it's just looking a little bit different. We might have to use these eventually uh, in the lesson, so it's good to rewrite them just to see it differently. All right, so this is the main one. If you want to star it, that's good, but we're going to find two new ones that are based off of this. Let's say, um, I'm going to just rewrite it here for in it, or for a second. All right, so we're going to do a little rearranging, kind of like how we did here. Let's say we take all of these terms, sine squared, cosine squared, and 1, and let's divide all of them by sine squared x. Now, we know we can do this based on our algebra rules because if we do something to one term, notice how we're dividing this one by sine squared x, we would have to do it to all of the other ones as well. After all, this is an equation, we got to keep it balanced. So if we do it to one term, we got to do it to the rest of them. Now let's see what we get when that happens or when we do this. Sine squared x divided by sine squared x is just 1. Cosine squared x divided by sine squared x, uh, well cosine divided by sine is cotangent, but since they were both squared, that means cotangent is squared. And 1 divided by sine squared x is a, a reciprocal trig function of cosecant squared x. So here is another Pythagorean identity that's based off of this one, but it's just looking a little bit different. We took every single term and divided it by sine squared x, and we got this. Just like we rearranged this first one, we can do the same thing uh, for this one. Uh, let's see. We can, what can we do? Let's get the cotangent squared all by itself. That means subtracting the 1 over. So we would have cosecant squared x minus 1. So another identity, but just taking this one and rewriting it. Now let's do something similar. Okay, so again, we'll start with our original Pythagorean identity up here. 
But this time, instead of dividing by sine squared x, let's divide by cosine squared x. See what happens in this case. So sine squared divided by cosine squared is tangent squared. Cosine squared divided by cosine squared is 1. And 1 over cosine squared reciprocal trig function there is secant squared. So here is another Pythagorean identity, again, based off of this original one. And we can rewrite it if we want to, maybe get tangent squared x by itself. We can subtract the 1 over, which would give us secant squared x minus 1. So I know there's a lot going on in this slide. Absolutely a lot. But I just want to or let you know that I will always give you uh, this Pythagorean identity. Eventually, this is going to kind of be burnt into your brain because we're going to be using it so much. But this is the main one. I will also give you this one and this one. But hopefully you'd be able to figure these out on your own just by dividing everything by sine squared or cosine squared x. It's these other ones that are kind of in clouds that you might have to figure out on your own. But again, if I give you the three uh, kind of main ones, if you will, you should be able to rewrite them, just move some things around to get those clouded ones. All right, so now that we have all these identities, let's try to reduce uh, at least this example three to a single trig ratio. To do that, we're going to use our hot tip number one. So according to Alicia Keys, our hot tip number one is to rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. Now this is nothing new, okay, we've been doing this so far in the last few lessons and even in this one. So let's rewrite tangent uh, and cosine and cosecant in terms of sine, cosine, and, and uh, reduce from there. So tangent we can rewrite as sine over cosine. Now cosine, we can just say is cosine over one. You might want to make cosine a fraction since we turn tangent into a fraction. And all of that is over cosecant, which is one over sine. So let's simplify. Looking at our numerator right here, multiplying some fractions across, notice how the cosines are going to cancel. So we're just left with sine over one, which is just sine. So a little more fraction work here. We have a uh, sine divided by one over sine. Instead of dividing by a fraction, our algebra skills tell us that we can multiply by the reciprocal. So instead of one over sine, the reciprocal would be sine over one, which is essentially just sine. And sine alpha, or not alpha, <laughs> sine theta times sine theta would give us sine squared theta. So go ahead and thank Alicia Keys. Hot tip number one, rewrite everything in sine and cosine. Alrighty, let's move on to our hot tip number two. The ring of fire. The ring of fire. So little Johnny Cash there is trying to get us to look for an identity. Okay, maybe one of those negative ones, maybe one of those Pythagorean ones, but we want to try to look for an identity. So taking a look at example number four, um, we should have a little red flag going off right here. We have 1 minus cosine squared x. That is one of our identities. Even though it's not one of the main ones, it's one of the main ones rewritten. Okay, one of those clouded ones, if you will, that we uh, just talked about. So this is an identity. Kind of should be throwing off red flags right there, an identity alert, if you will. 1 minus cosine squared x should equal sine squared x based on that identity. So instead of uh, writing it as this, the identity tells us we can simply replace it. They mean the same thing, they're equal to each other after all, so we can do a little substitution or rewriting. So if we want to verify, we want to make sure that this piece would equal uh, the right-hand side tangent squared x. Remember in the last lesson, we always try to start with the more complicated side and work from there to eventually keep the other side in mind. This is our goal. This is what we want to end with. Now, if we take a look at what we have here, since we rewrote the numerator, sine squared x divided by cosine squared x is simply tangent squared x, one of those um, quotient identities. And that's exactly what we were looking for. So we have verified the identity. We know that this side would simplify to tangent squared x. So thank you, Johnny. Let's go ahead and talk about our hot tip number three. I think that you should. 
All right, so looking at example number five, Usher there is trying to tell us to use algebra to make equivalent expressions. So we're going to use some algebra skills such as like factoring or combining like terms uh, to get some equivalent expressions, meaning equal pieces. So notice how we eventually, again, starting with the more complicated side, hopefully we notice that that's this left-hand side. Somehow we want to be able to turn the top portion into this and the bottom portion into this, okay, equivalent expressions. So let's see what we can do. If we look at the top, hopefully we notice how this piece right there is kind of cluing us into factoring. Sine squared alpha plus two sine alpha plus one kind of fits our overall factoring profile Notice how it's like x squared plus 2x plus 1, just instead of x's, we're talking about sine, okay, those trig, uh, trig functions. So let's go ahead and factor the top, just like how we kind of would here. Two numbers that multiply to 1 but add to 2 would give us sine x plus 1 and sine x plus 1. So 1 times 1 is 1, but 1 plus 1 gives us 2. So notice how we're kind of getting this guy right here. Those x's should actually be alphas. That's my bad. Okay, so those are alphas. And we're starting to get there. We have 1 plus sine alpha, sine alpha plus 1, same thing, just rewritten. So let's see, how can we kind of rewrite cosine squared alpha like 1 minus sine alpha? So this is where an identity might want to be used. So instead of cosine squared alpha, we can use one of our Pythagorean identities to rewrite it as 1 minus sine squared alpha. And that's really close to this, but we don't really want sine squared, we just want a regular sine. If you notice here, this is a difference of squares, meaning we can factor further. 1's a perfect square, sine squared is a perfect square. So just like how we factored the top, let's go ahead and factor the bottom. So let's see what we get. The top's going to stay the same. We already factored that. And difference of squares, the perfect square of 1 is 1. The perfect square of sine squared is just sine. And according to our difference of squares, 1's plus and 1's minus. So let's see what's going to happen here. Notice how uh, these terms are going to cancel. Sine alpha plus 1, 1 plus sine alpha, same thing, just uh, flip-flopped, if you will. So those are going to cancel, and we're left with sine alpha plus 1 over 1 minus sine alpha, which is exactly the same thing here. Okay, just instead of 1 plus sine alpha, I have sine alpha plus 1. Again, you can rewrite it, you can flip the order, but we would still get this as our identity, which is verified. So factoring algebra rules here might be another hot tip for you to use. Thanks, Usher. Let's go ahead and move on to our hot tip number four. Jeez, we're just ranking these up today. So I guess there's a little Billy Joel there telling us to combine the fractions. So notice how we don't really have any fractions in this case, but usually rewriting things in terms of sine and cosine is really going to help us. That was one of our previous hot tips, actually. So uh, let's actually do that first. Cotangent, we can rewrite as cosine x over sine x. And notice how we're multiplying that by cosine x. Oop, that should be a c. <laughs> so cosine x over 1. And we're adding sine of x, which we can rewrite as sine x over 1. Okay, we're just rewriting everything as fractions. And our goal is to eventually keep the end in mind. Um, this would be a cosecant x. So let's see if we can take this mess, maybe combine some fractions, use some fraction work that you learned all the way back in like 6th or 7th grade, and see if we can get cosecant in the end. So let's take a look at our first piece here. Multiplication uh, comes before addition when we use our order of operations. So if we multiply these two fractions together, we're going to get cosine squared x over sine x, and we want to add sine x over 1. So you got to ask yourself, how do we add fractions? Think back to 6th or 7th grade. Hopefully we remember we need a common denominator. Notice how this is a sine x, this is a 1. So how can we get those to be the same? 
Well, we can change a 1 into a sine x by multiplying it by a sine x. But if we multiply the bottom of this fraction by sine x, that means we have to multiply the top as well. So we're not really changing our first fraction at all. That's going to stay the same. But our second one is going to end up being sine squared x over sine x. So now notice how they have a common denominator. That means we can simply add the tops or numerators, a more appropriate term, and we can keep the denominator. Now always remember the goal in mind. This is what we want, and cosecant is actually 1 over sine x. So notice how we're starting to get there. We eventually have sine x in the denominator. Somehow we got to change the numerator to a 1. And hopefully, little red flag going off here, identity alert, that this is one of our Pythagorean identities. Cosine squared x plus sine squared x is 1. Okay, main one here, huge idea, identity, we can rewrite it as 1. Now, since we get 1 over sine x, that is the same as cosecant. So there we go, we proved it. Thank you, Billy Joel, kind of telling us to combine some fractions, get a common denominator. We have verified the identity. All right, let's bring on the pain. Try one that's a little bit more difficult, that's going to use a lot of these hot tips we've been talking about today. So, we want to verify the identity. Let's try to take this left-hand side and turn it into the right-hand side. Always keep the goal in mind. Somehow we got to change tangent squared theta minus sine squared theta into tangent squared theta times sine squared theta. So, they look very similar, but they're actually, and slightly different, if you will. This one's subtraction, this one is multiplication, but they're actually equal to each other. We're going to try to prove or verify why this is true. So, let's start with the left-hand side a little bit more complicated since we're subtracting and maybe turn it into the right hand side. So one of the very first things that I like to do is think about it in terms of sine and cosine. That was one of our hot tips. So let's change tangent squared theta into sine squared theta over cosine squared theta. And sine squared theta is always or is already in terms of a sine. We'll just put it over one since this was a fraction. Okay, now we should see this immediately. We have a fraction minus a fraction. In order, to, in order to continue, hopefully your sixth grade self is telling you we need common denominators in order to subtract fractions. So somehow we got to turn a 1 into a cosine squared theta. To do that, we're going to have to multiply by cosine squared theta on the bottom as well as the top. Keep your fraction balanced. So, now that we have this common denominator, we can take our numerators and subtract them. So sine squared theta minus, and we're going to have sine squared theta cosine squared theta, if we multiply those two together. And that's all over our common denominator now of cosine squared theta. So always keep the end in mind. We're trying to get tangent squared theta times sine squared theta really isn't looking like it just yet, which means we got a little bit more work to do. Let's take a look at our complicated numerator right here. Hopefully we can notice how both this first term and the second term have a sine squared in common, which is a GCF, a greatest common factor. They both have a sine squared in common, so that means we can factor it out. So if we take out a sine squared theta from both terms, we're left with a 1 minus cosine squared theta, and it's all over cosine squared theta. Again, keep the end in mind. Notice how our first thing here we have is a tangent squared theta, and if you look at what you have here, maybe this is kind of popping out at you, we have a sine squared theta divided by a cosine squared theta. This piece is giving us the tangent. Okay, so if this piece is giving us tangent, that means this other piece, the 1 minus cosine squared theta, should be giving us the sine squared theta. And it is, hopefully a little red flag is going off, this is one of our identities. 1 minus cosine squared theta is the same thing as sine squared theta. So there we go, we've proven our identity. A little work, we had to uh, get a common denominator, do a little bit of factoring, a little bit of analysis here, if you will, always keeping the end in mind, but we were able to verify the identity.
All right, so what I want you to do is pause the video and try this one on your own. A little complicated, definitely labor intensive, but I want you to try it first. A little Dwayne Wade here is to is here to kind of help you out, give you some motivation. After all, we want to bring the heat. So go ahead and start with your more complicated side, definitely this fraction, and always keep the end in mind. We want to get 1 minus 2 cosine squared alpha. So pause the video, see how you do, and I'll be back in a little bit to check it out. All right, so let's check it out and see how we did. Focusing on the more complicated side, we definitely have a big fraction here. Let's rewrite all these different tangents and cotangents in terms of sine and cosine. So tangent of, I've changed all the alphas to x's, okay? If you don't like alphas or thetas, you can definitely make them x's or any symbol or variable you want, really. So tangent of theta, where I rewrote as sine x over cosine x, and cotangent, I rewrote as sine x over sine x, or cosine over sine, sorry. And then very similarly, I did the bottom piece as well. So notice how uh, we kind of have a lot of fractions here. In the numerator part of the overall fraction, we have this fraction minus this one. So if we're subtracting fractions, that means we need to have a common denominator. This one is a cosine, this one is a sine. To get them to be the same, I gotta multiply this fraction on top and bottom by cosine, because that's what this piece has. And in order to get a common denominator over here, I need to multiply the top and the bottom by sine, because that's what this one has. So if we do that, sine x times sine x is sine squared x. Cosine x times cosine x is cosine squared x, and notice how we're subtracting. And our common denominator, if this has a sine and a cosine, and this has a sine and a cosine, it's all over sine times cosine. Just like the numerator, you can do the same thing for the denominator, and we would get this piece right here. Now, when we are dividing by a fraction, we can rewrite it as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I just took this bottom piece, found the reciprocal, which would be this. And this is where kind of the magic happens. Notice how we have a sine x cosine x in this denominator and this numerator. And since we're multiplying, these are going to cancel each other out. Oh, there we go, crossing it off. So those are gone. But hopefully we also notice that this piece right here is an identity, okay, one of our Pythagorean identities, my pen will write, sine squared x plus cosine squared x can change into a 1. So really we have sine squared x minus cosine squared x all over 1, which is just this piece right here. Anything over 1 is just itself. Now remember, keeping the goal in mind, okay, our end piece here, we want a 1 minus 2 cosine squared x or alpha, whatever variable you wrote. So we already have 1 cosine squared x. We eventually want to have 2 of them. So we're not really going to do anything with this piece. We're going to have to rewrite sine squared x somehow. And we're going to use our identity. Sine squared x is the same as 1 minus cosine squared x. So if we rewrite sine squared x in this fashion, notice how we have minus cosine squared x minus cosine squared x. That means we have two of them. So in the end, we have 1 minus 2 cosine squared x, exactly what we wanted to prove. Little shout out, uh, Dwayne Wade saying, go! Okay, so we brought the heat. Uh, maybe we won that MBA title. And uh, good luck on that practice and the application and definitely in that mastery check. I'll see you guys later.